Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks to Dave and, and Olaf for the encouragement to uh, submit a paper for today's session. I'm representing uh, colleagues and students, former students, um, uh, at the University of Sheffield. Standing within a, an enclosed later prehistoric settlement above the village of Rakib, Gwyneth, around this time last year, we were debating how to complete a survey of the enclosure. The enclosure had recently been cleared of a dense cloak of gorse, and our task as part of the Carnethai Landscape Partnership Scheme was to produce a measured survey of the now open and visible earthworks. The second reason for being at Rakib was that one of us, Tashi, was undertaking a project for a master's level module at the University of Sheffield, and he was learning the process of archaeological survey. There was a difference of opinion on how we should approach the survey. One opinion said that we should collect drone imagery, use photogrammetric software to generate a surface model. Tashi could then use the model to identify the archaeological features, check them on the ground, and add interpretations to a version of the model. It wouldn't take long to complete the field work or to complete the photography when the wind had settled. Walking over the earthworks, we find it difficult to reconcile them with the 1950s Royal Commission plan. The features were indistinct in places. What was a built platform? What was the natural lie of the land? Yet one line of reasoning went if we create a surface model using the drone imagery, the distinctions need not be made now. We can defer the decisions and the interpretations to later. Now, I resisted this approach. Uh, I was in the minority, it must be said, for at least a good part of the debate. I was keen on a more traditional form of recording and representation, survey at the boot sole's edge, so to speak. Which are, the, which are the slopes that we interpreted as constructed or formed through human activity? Where are the platforms? Which parts of the enclosure bank are original, which might result from later quarrying? My attempts to justify recording bricks of slopes for hatchers seemed arcane alongside a technology that could generate a digital representation of the surface in a matter of hours. Hatchers were a digital skewermorph to draw on James Taylor and Nicola Delunto's use of the terminology, rendering in digital form a manual way of surveying. Why spend time interpreting and recording the earthworks as a hatcher plan? After all, it might take Tashi several days to survey the site manually, learning the skills and getting his eye in. In that time, weather permitting, we could visit and create models of four or more enclosures. Our task in this paper is to explain, justify even, why our answer to this debate and similar discussions in recent years has been to implement survey strategies that combine aerial and ground-based observation and recording. And we recognise in these methods complementary ways of seeing that increase rather than diminish students' capabilities as surveyors. And there's a broader question here of how, as educators and students, we should respond to technological innovations within the profession. The perspective that we offer here is that the priority should be in enabling students to become critical and reflective practitioners. That is to say they have the knowledge, capability and confidence to work productively with technologies for the purpose of furthering understanding about the past and conserving heritage. Now archaeological survey and Mark's already kind of touched on this, well, touched on it, given far more detail than I will, has always been mediated through technology. And inevitably, the changes in those technologies have altered sometimes fundamentally what we see, how we survey, and what we depict. And this tradition is important to acknowledge as we take account of the latest technologies to disrupt our ways of working. Now, our current experiences are not new, although the pace at which changes are happening is exceptional and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. And I'm going to spare everyone a kind of potted and inadequate history of survey methods. Um, uh, there are others in the audience far more skilled and uh, able to do that than me. But I think the historical perspective offers value in arguing that photogrammetric survey with drones, 
and LIDAR from drones represents a continuation of some existing trends, high density point collection and the distancing of the surveyor from the object of the survey. In their 2015 paper, Opitz and Limp identified high density survey and measurement as a major advance in the resolution, speed and precision with which archaeologists could record materials and landscapes. The genesis of this advance arguably lay with GNSS and robotic total stations that created the capability to collect precise point locations rapidly with maximum independence from control networks. And it was these technologies that properly opened up the debate which had simmered for a while about what we measured, features or surfaces, and how we depicted archaeological landscapes and where the location of subjectivity should be within the archaeological process. Laser scanning shifted this innovation to a new level. The question of whether to record surface or feature kind of came redundant. The surveyor now stood aside while the instrument collected the data independently. The resolution and the precision were extraordinary. The data sets at the time seemed large and the processing increasingly specialised. And these changes brought a potential challenge to how surveys were undertaken and critically where interpretation happened. From the field, it moved to the screen. Drones and close-range digital photogrammetry have changed the position from which points could be collected, making the instrument mobile and airborne. A survey can now occur without setting foot on the ground. And these tools have enabled access to previously hard to access and vulnerable landscapes, but they have also enabled access in a different sense. High density measurement can be undertaken at a small fraction of the cost of time and money and with significantly less technical software and skills. Some key trends to observe across all these three stages are the distancing of the surveyor from the survey object, a widening and democratising of access to high density measurement tools and the convergence of aerial and ground based perspectives. I just want to say a couple of things about both those points. The widening or democratising of access to high density measurement tools is particularly interesting in an educational context where funding resources can be a challenge and especially on a scale that makes tools accessible to students. You know, we can buy an awful lot of 30 metre tapes and drawing boards compared with a single image, um, imaging laser scanner. Yet this accessibility has two sides. Yes, it's easier to undertake a survey, in inverted commas, using a drone in terms of creating a scaled surface model. On the other hand, it diminishes the engagement with the material that enables knowledge and interpretation. We may become less knowledgeable and experienced of archaeological materials and landscapes, and therefore less effective as interpreters of those materials. Now, the convergence of aerial and ground-based perspectives, on the other hand, carries some advantages. Aerial archaeology is founded on the principle that the perspective offered from the air enables access to alternative information about the archaeological features. The aerial view can quite dramatically alter our ground-based interpretations. In the past, we've explored these intersections through the incorporation of aerial imagery into the survey process, printing out some obliques and taking them into the field, for instance. But with the widespread availability of drone imagery, we can now access that aerial viewpoint in real time and put it in the hands of the surveyor on the ground. There can be a convergence and a complementarity of aerial and ground-based ways of seeing. So how should our working protocols and educational programmes respond to these technological changes? One approach is to modify the syllabus, add the new methods by either taking away or diminishing the importance of other methods. A new class or workshop, a new section to the reading list, lose the classes on laying out baselines and grids and using tip and offset to record earthworks and replace them with a bit of theory and then practical sessions in theory on flying drones or processing images using Agisoft. In fact, we could entirely discard longer established methods of surveying from the syllabus or at least only offer them as case studies. Now these are dilemmas, if that's not an overstatement, that we've been working through for nearly two decades 
in Sheffield since we began running a survey field course as part of our master's programme in 2005. Now, sadly, and we're unlikely to make it to the 20th anniversary given changes that are happening in Sheffield and have happened over the last few years. The course and accompanying classes and assessments make up a quarter of the taught component of the programme. And we want to reflect a little as a group on what principles have evolved to underpin the course and how these relate to the question of how we incorporate drones in digital phot photogrammetry. Now, rather than provide learning outcomes and aims, I'm going to use another example to illustrate how the course runs and how drones and photogrammetry have affected what and how we teach. I'll take us to a different time and place than for earlier, spring 2021. Lockdowns had eased, but the university remained pretty reluctant to allow in-person teaching, never mind fieldwork. We contrived a way to make it happen, first by running the theoretical sessions online and then creating a whole series of video tutorials for each of the methods that we usually teach in the first part of the course. Through these sessions, we built up students' understanding of the purposes, principles and methods of archaeological survey. By stalling until May, I think it was mid or late May, we finally managed to run a field course in the Peak District and in places that could be reached by public transport. The university in its wisdom felt that hire, hire vehicles were inappropriate, but it was fine for students to all pile onto a different, different bus twice a day. <laughs> Nether Haddon is the location of a medieval settlement that was abandoned by the 15th century and is po possibly around the time that Haddon Hall, which is on the map there, Haddon Hall's Deer Park was established. A rapid sketch plan in the 1990s offered the only archaeological information that we had alongside the scheduling and HER descriptions. The challenge at Nether Haddon was identifying the layout for the medieval settlement, disentangling this from later fields and parkland, as well as teasing out the possible earlier features such as barrows. Nether Haddon's a really nice example of a parkland landscape like nearby Chatsworth, where there's excellent preservation of complex multi-period earthworks. As part of the field course, two contributors to this presentation, Helen Basson and Tom Millington, Tom's in the picture there, led survey projects at Nether Haddon. Helen focused on creating a 1 to 500 plan and interpretation of the earthworks. Tom generated a surface model using photogrammetry and completed a program of geophysical survey. No single approach offered a complete view and this was a key thing that Helen and Tom learnt during the process. Now, there were important debates during the fieldwork and after about the value of each method and the aerial view played a critical role in these debates, as did the geophysics, and a critical role in interpretation for distinguishing likely building platforms and the form of the buildings. And a key observation we want to make is that the aerial imagery and the dialogue between the survey teams, to pick up on a, a key term that Olaf mentioned earlier, had an important pedagogic role in the process. Is that working? Yeah. Helen and the ground survey team found the earthworks immensely confusing to record at the beginning. They gained clarity as their confidence increased, which was itself a product of time spent undertaking the survey but was also derived from the perspectives offered from the aerial imagery and the geophysics, which were going on at the same time and alongside the work. At Nether Haddon, working from the ground up and from the air down, led to a new interpretation of the earthwork features and to Helen and Tom presenting their work at Derbyshire Archaeology Day. The Nether Haddon survey exemplifies the pedagogic model of the field course over the years. While we teach theories and methods to some extent didactically and experientially, some of the key learning happens during the field projects as students develop a capacity and a confidence to lead a survey and interpret an archaeological landscape. Drone survey brings another complementary tool that enhances the pedagogy of the survey project rather than inhibiting it. And there are three aspects that would argue that make this successful. 
The project enables students to build familiarity with a particular landscape through sustained fieldwork and the in-depth knowledge that comes from making interpretive decisions about the value of topographic features. I think we can all empathise with that experience of feeling somewhat lost and confused when first encountering an area of complex earthworks. And that experience is extent, accentuated as our, that's most acute if it's your first survey. Yet surveying gradually changes our relationship and familiarity with the landscape, a form of what William Carraher Hare called terms slow archaeology. Creating, analysing and interpreting drone, drone imagery enhances that process of slow familiarisation and the confidence that it engenders. The course focuses on the survey process and the purposes of archaeological survey. We don't systematically assess technical skills and methods. We introduce familiarity with a range of methods since this underpins decisions about what methods to use and what can be achieved through a survey. But it's the process and purpose that is prioritised, not the detailed technical knowledge. Students specialise in, in methods, if we can say that, through their individual survey projects. The third point I want to make is that in Welsh, dusky means to learn and to teach. And I think this ably reflects how the field course develops by breaking down the distinctions between learning and teaching and learner and teacher. This builds genuine collaborations through communities of practice, as Angela Brew terms them. The options for drone survey at both Rakeb and Nether Haddon facilitated debate and brought complementary perspectives together. In essence, it aided a dialogue within the survey team and between the different forms of data that they were producing. To offer an overall characterization, I'd say the survey course and the fieldwork project develop the students' capacities as critical practitioners, learning to see problems from different points of view. They can recognize and explain the terms in which they create interpretations about the landscape. These critical perspectives emerge because we switch our positions in relation to the landscape and relation to the technologies that mediate our viewpoints. The drone imagery offers a different tool for achieving these differing viewpoints or ways of seeing. It encourages dialogue and criticality. We'll conclude by returning to the enclosure above Rakib and Tashi's survey. When we walked over the enclosure after four days undertaking the survey, Tashi identified each platform that he could confidently recognise and some more dubious ones and the reasons for their inclusion. And this informed understanding of the, and this informed understanding of the enclosure emerged both during the slow act of making the survey but also scrutinising the digital model, both at the desk and in the field. We had developed relatively subtle arguments for why the material at the upslope side related to quarrying, rather than being part of the enclosure, and identified subtle features, such as the edges of retaining walls on the outside of the bank. We also debated the merits of the tools we were using and the ways we represented the survey. This dialogue was important in shaping the survey, perhaps, but it was even more important in shaping us as surveyors. This appreciation emerged not from learning methods in isolation, but by learning them in the field, in dialogue, as part of an archaeological process. That's how we support coming generations of critical and reflective practitioners who knowledgeably work with and integrate technology. Now, we always carry the risk with technology that we fetishize the kit and use its novelty le to legitimise our interpretations. And I must admit, I struggled for images that didn't have the kit as centre point in the <laughs> picture. How often do we make the, the equipment and the instrument the subject of our images? As the technology distances the surveyor from the object of the survey, both in terms of physical distance and in terms of time, that sense of shortening the time spent engaged in data collection and interpretation, then we need archaeological surveyors with the capabilities to understand the technology critically. How is it impacting on how we survey? What can we see? What do we depict how and why? 
The imagery created from drones, the ways of seeing that they enable, bring a new dialogue into play, but they do not change the fundamental need for surveyors to be foremost critical practitioners. And our point in this paper is that drones can play a valuable role in enabling those critical perspectives. They broaden our viewpoints and bring different perceptions of landscape into dialogue with one another. They are fast technologies that can contribute to the slow task of learning landscape survey. I'll close by thanking you all for listening uh, and acknowledging all the institutions that have supported the fieldwork described in this paper. Thank you.